to another unwinding with fiber and fabric. It is a couple weeks into the new year and I have finally settled upon my 2023 crafting, I wouldn't call them goals, more of themes. <laughs> and I wanted to share them with you today as well as I want to talk about Angora and spin a little. So let's dive right into the discussion about um, my themes. So when I took the time to reflect upon Vlogmas and, um, and how it made me feel and how it helped me accomplish things, I realized that there, there, there were a couple components that really made a difference in my, um, my, my daily emotional, I guess, health. And while I do not intend to do a daily vlog, um, every day of 2023, I did realize that having, uh, the structure every day of taking time to craft for me, that, that, that structure, that goal, that, um, that desire, that it really helped me stay centered and not get caught up in the chaos of the world quite as much. So I want to incorporate that um, into my daily life. <laughs> um, whether that is having this guy come out more often, <laughs> my jar of suggestions, or as what I've been doing in so far this month, if you follow me on Instagram at, or Facebook, you may have noticed having it so that every day I accomplish something, whether or not it's a finished product project, or it's a component of a project that I actually fin have, have something tangible that I can say, this is what I did today. I know that back in the days when I worked full time, when I, um, when I also during the time that I was raising my children, that these kind of tangible um, things, they, they helped me f f ward off the, the frustrations, the doubts, the um, self-criticism that often comes when we get a little bit overwhelmed or a little bit too tired, we become susceptible to, to these feelings. And so by having something tangible that I can say, I've accomplished this today, it really can make a difference. Now, I know that for some people, um, I know my mom, she always, she had a, a habit of, she always did the dishes before she went to bed because she said she wanted to get up and have, have a clean sink in the morning. So she always did the dishes before she went to bed. And that was something that m helped her um, wind down the day and I guess probably rest more easily in the evening. So it's those kind of things. But I'm really good at working myself to a bone doing chores. Uh, in fact, uh, my tendency over the years has been to need something to take me out of that routine, take me out of that habit of, of all the things that have to be done, taking precedence over the things that give us joy. Because sometimes we get into a cycle of have to be done's that actually mean that that's all we're doing. And sometimes we lose sight that some of the have to be done's are really not as half to as we think they are. So that's always been something that I've struggled with. And so having the jar, <laughs> having uh, something that I'm trying to accomplish that is tangible, that can really help me with my feeling of accomplishment, my feeling of, 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 of self-worth value, um, peace, um, tuning out the world, all of these things. So trying to figure out how to uh, incorporate without having a daily vlog, it kind of just happened. I started <laughs> making an embroidery design item, 
a, a, an item every day that, are, you know, there's trying out embroidery designs. Now I have tons of embroidery designs. I have tons of fabric. My stash is huge. And, and that leads me into the second theme, using up, use, not using up, using my stash, not saving it for tomorrow, but actually using it today. So, but going back to <laughs> the first thing, I kind of fell into this. I just started making a design every day. Now I'm a practical person. I don't just want to do a test. sew. in the embroidery machine embroidery world, we talk about test sews, see how they're going to work on our fabric, um, before we use it in, uh, um, a, a, a big dedicated project. But I, I am, I spent too many years with my grandmother and I have just become too frugal. And so to me, doing a test so frustrates me because then it's just not usable. So every day I'm trying to try out a new design, try out something different, but doing it in a way that has function. So I've been making a lot of mug rugs and I have been making pillows. I have a couple wall hangings that are in the process and that's my goal. So every day to try to come up with um, something and oh, I've been <laughs> just, I love some of the embroidery designs by um, a design company called Creative Kiwi because they have made a bunch of what I call freestanding applique. Applique designs that don't actually have to be applied to something because they can, um, they can, you know, stand up on their own. And if you were, go back to my fall stuff, you'll remember behind me, I had a couple of those things. I had a big witch, I had a turkey. And so I want to make more of those. I want to, and I want to make these things, have them hang on the curtain behind me more of my calendar pages, but testing out designs, trying out the designs, using the fabric, but still having them have a function. So using these things that I've accumulated is the second theme. First theme being every day getting up and taking that 15 to 20 minutes, whether it's spinning or it's embroidery or it's crochet, but taking that, that time, and I will admit when it comes to the sewing room, it is a lot easier for me to have the project start to finish in one day, <laughs> but it is also very hard to have it only be 15 to 20 minutes. <laughs> so I am multitasking while the embroidery machine is doing its thing. My knitting goes in there with me or <laughs> carding fiber or cleaning up stash, but I am trying to multitask. But so that theme of every day having that goal to get up and accomplish something to make sure before the day is over that I have something creative to show for my day. Not simply using all my spoons, for those of you that know the spoon theory, um, not using all my spoons just on the things that have to be done. Because sometimes they can they can be done tomorrow or a little later today, or they can be segmented. It means <laughs> being judicious in how I accomplish things rather than being concerned about what maybe other people might think. I'm going to try in 2023 to be less concerned about what might happen tomorrow and more concerned about enjoying today. So if all of a sudden somebody comes over to my house and they only give me a little bit of notice that they're coming, they may come to a house that has cat hair that still needs to be <laughs> swept up, um, vacuumed up, whatever. But that's okay because I also currently have a giant cat tree in the middle of the room that they would be in. So. They may come to a crazy cat lady's house, but 
that's better than spending a whole lot of emotional energy always trying to be ready for what's happening tomorrow as opposed to just living in the moment today. So with that being said, the second theme is to use the stuff that I have put aside for tomorrow. The stuff that I have, have said, oh, I'll wait and use it on a special project. I'll wait and use it when I have grandkids. I will wait and use it when there's a special person I want to give it to. I am going to try in 2023 to be the special person that I accumulated, accumulated all of this for. That is my aspiration. Yes, I like <laughs> stuff that would be very suitable for little kids. I like toys. I like Duplos. I like... Um, I like whimsical designs that are designed for a nursery or for toddlers. I like quiet books. <laughs> I like those kind of things. So this is the year I'm going to make them, but not for a grandkid that may or may not come in the future. But for me, knowing fully well that if I make them, they will someday go to someone other than me. So, I'm going to spin the Angora. I am going to knit with it. I'm not going to save it as much for a rainy day. Because today is the rainy day. Today is the day I need the joy. Today is the day that I need the value that this brings into my life. Trying to worry a little bit less about tomorrow. That is a tough thing and people who know me know that is a very tough thing for me. <laughs> but that is part of the reason why I have Angora out. So the other reason I have Angora out, the main reason I have the Angora out is that I have this fiber that I had spun up a couple years back and I decided it would make a fabulous shawl for me. <laughs> Whether or not somebody in my family steals it in the future, doesn't matter. I'm making it now. This is a merino silk blend that um, I got the fiber from Knit Picks. I dyed um, one grouping of it purple. I dyed one grouping of it green. Um, speckle dyed, not very intense dyed. And I had one that didn't have any dye. And I spun the three together for a three ply. It is lovely. It is soft. It is a perfect. Um, weight of yarn for my um, shawls that I've been making and I have it started now you may notice it's fuzzy and then it's not fuzzy because when I was making my last shawl which I talked about through December I realized that while I kept using it in the bottom the the, the final rows it'd be lovely to have some of the angora up by my neck and so I started this project and when I started the project, I started using some of the, what I call um, creamsicle. It's a fawn, I think, colored um, Angora. I used that and I realized you can't have that cream color, that um, sandy color. This, is, this color here is much more of a gray and I, I really didn't want to interfere with the color by adding the Angora. So I went down into my stash and discovered that I did have some, um, some of the gray Angora already spun up so that I could use it. So I started over again, I put this in with it and I'm very pleased with how it's turning out. But the hank that I used, I used all of it up for this neck area. And yes, it goes around my neck and then it, I, I go to just, knitting with the one strand. So it's really lovely because it doesn't just give it a the Angora bloom um, that you already start to see, but by knitting with two strands of yarn here at the neck, it gives it a little more, um, I think, um, density and stability. Um, and that's one of the weak areas I found it with my first, um, my, my first capelet is it just feels a little bit thin right here at the neck. 
So what I realized though, is that when I get to the bottom of it, I'm going to need some Angora to do the band on the bottom that I like to do. And while I do have a couple small hanks of gray spun up already, I don't have enough of it and enough of the right type to, to do the bottom. And that's what made me think of, of coming and talking about Angora today. Because if I bring this up, this and this is from the same rabbit. This is from a different rabbit. But you will notice there is a bit of a difference. This one specifically, you can see the guard hairs. And it's not just that it's dark hair. It's that his, um, in this one, he was a black and white rabbit. His guard hair was um, much more defined, uh, a, a larger micron, you might say, than his undercoat. And that is not uh, an untypical, atypical. It, it, it happens. But you also have Angora rabbits that their entire coat looks like undercoat rather than a, sp a very defined guard hair versus um, a very fine undercoat. So in, this is Freddy, and this is Ollivander. Ollivander, he just looked like a big poof. And it was very difficult to see the difference between his guard hair. Yes, he had guard hair but it was very difficult to see the difference between his guard hair and um, his undercoat, at least with the naked eye. So what I want is I want Ollivander though, because his um, fiber tends to be, it, it's going to be a softer, a less, less, there's gonna be less um, bloom to it, or I should say there's gonna be less halo because it is going to bloom. You're going to see the fluff but it's not going to have a big halo of fluff around it. Whereas Freddy, especially that little Hank, once it's knit, it's going to halo. It's going to really puff out. You're going to see those guard hairs. And unlike guard hairs on other animals, this stuff is not in any way, shape or form itchy. So that started me thinking that I wanted to talk to you a little bit about the Angora show you let's see so this is this is some of freddy okay and see you can kind you can see kind of the how the hair it actually you can see what looks like individual strands now everything that you think is an individual strand may be two or three but you can still see what looks like hair Whereas with Ollivander, when I get some of his, it's very hard for you to see de defined. You see how it's more of a very cloud-like, more uh, even fluff. So it's not just the difference between, say, a German Angora, a French Angora, or an English Angora. Individual animals have individual characteristics, and some will have really defined guard hair and others will not. Both create beautiful Angora yarn. They're just a little different in how you want to use them in your knitting or um, your fiber arts. So the second thing, so that's the first thing I wanted to notice that Angora, not all Angora looks the same, feels the same and, and should be used for the same end product. Some will create a huge halo. Some will just be a soft, delicate um, yarn. It's the different. It's kind of like the difference between worsted and woolen. One's going to be airy and full. One might be um, um, more slick. The thing with Angora, though, is that um, you're going to get a bloom. You're going to get a halo. It's just, it, it's hard not to have that happen. If that's not what you want, you don't really want to go with Angora. So the next thing though, so that's the first thing. The second thing that I wanted to talk about with Angora, um, and I'm going to, going to um, spin some of that, but 
the second thing I wanted to talk to you about with Angora is I pre-wash everything. You can see they're just tons and tons of airy fibers. These are animals. These are animals that, um, that we don't bathe. I don't know if there's somebody else. I can't imagine anybody bathing an Angora rabbit. The, the, oh, the matted that you would get. But when you normally get Angora from a breed or it's been combed off. Sometimes it'll be clipped off um, the animal sheds. And so the combing process, just like combing a, your, your dog or cat, you'll get the fiber. And when it is combed off, Oftentimes it will come looking like this, right off the animal. Um, ready to spin. Because, I was looking, ah, they'll use something like a slicker brush like this. They'll use um, a comb like um, you'd comb with your cat and dog that you can get. Um, because the animals that are, that, that want to shed on their own and you can what we call pluck them it doesn't hurt them it's grooming their hair off that wants to come off as it is if it doesn't come off it's going to mat because they do shed um at least some of them have that trait um others they'll be clipped um because they don't eat readily shed but like with the sheep the excess hair does need to come off so Groomers will use something like this, or they'll use a comb, but it comes off and you usually get a light fluff. The thing is, you'll have little tiny particles of urine still in that fiber. And if someone is allergic and you start to spin it, it puts it in the air and trust me, if they're allergic, it's not going to be a fun day in your house. So I got in the habit of always pre-washing my fibers because it was just <sighs> one too many experiences with somebody having an allergic reaction for me to not really take it seriously. What people are worried about is that after it's been washed, instead of looking like this, it looks like this. And they're like, oh my goodness, I've matted it. This is not matted with just a little bit of flicking, a little bit of parting. And I do, I'm using um, cotton combs or cotton, I'm sorry, cotton cards, uh, one, 110, 111, but cotton cards. Um, so the DPI is very close together. Um, and I'm using, um, child size cotton cards. So just a little batch at a time, opening it back up and it's ready to spin that much. So you can also, I don't have a second one here. Um, you can also open it back up with one of these. So it is not something that you should be afraid of. It is, um, it looks like it's matted, but it is not. If you're careful in the washing it, this is one fiber that it is really about just soaking it and then spinning it dry and letting it dry and not touching it and just letting it be while it dries and fluffs up. So let's talk about the spinning of it. First, let me tell you, Angora is static electricity charged, <laughs> especially in the dry winter months. So I have a wooden bowl because it doesn't have the issue with the static. And then with the bowl sitting in my lap and the fiber in the bowl, I just, ah, I think, there, 
It is not the easiest thing to spin while recording um, because I do have a lot of a lot of um, there's a lot of take up pull on my on my um, wheel right now. So there we go. But we can get this. So I am spinning this very thin. My recommendation is to spin it thin and have multiple plies rather than spin it thick. But I have spun it thick and I have crocheted and knitted with it thick and it's lovely. So don't be afraid if you if if you if you haven't spun it before and you can't spin it thin, it still makes a lovely fun yarn if you spin it thick and ply it thick. <laughs> Just use it. Give it give it a try. But this is definitely a fiber that is going to force me to slow down, spin it thin, because for my application, I want a thin final, two, probably a two ply, because I don't need anything more than that, but a final thin um, yarn. Because all I'm going to do is knit this when I knit this while holding this yarn and my other yarn to just give an extra detail. So thin is better for me at this point. If I wanted to have a thicker yarn, as I said, I would spin thin and then have multiple plies. I, I just find it is, um, the, the yarn itself holds up better, it pills less. Um, and yes, this fiber, when blended, this, this fiber specifically, when blended with um, wool, you, you only use something like less than 20% of Angora to 80% wool. You're gonna get such a warm, warm garment, but it can pill if it's spun in a thick, chunky yarn. Even if it's just being blended with the wool, um, the Angora really needs to have a little bit more twist and then ply, not an over twist or anything, but a twist and apply to hold all of those fine, very fine particles, all these little microns in place. It's not about trying to keep it from having a bloom. It's about just making sure that it is all being held in place. And I am doing in this case, um, a very short, I'd say backwards draw or forwards draw. Either way, little tiny short draw in which I'm pulling my hands apart from each other, sometimes by pulling forward with my um, left hand, sometimes pulling back with my right. But it's easier for me just to keep my right hand, my right arm with my elbow on the arm of the chair and just pull forward with my left hand and I can do a little bit of a longer draw, okay? I can let the twist go into the fiber, but <laughs> I like to have a lot of tug <laughs> and it will just tug it right out of my hands um, if I'm not careful. And while I'm videoing, I'm not being as careful as I otherwise would be. So that is the spinning with Angora. I hope it hasn't been too rushed. I hope I haven't gone too long with this, this video. I wanted to say, um, before I wrap up though, um, so I'm spinning this Angora. <laughs> I don't know how long it will take me. Two weeks from now, I may be doing another video, me still spinning Angora. But <clears throat> I do need it for my project. And as I said, my, my, my goal is to not wait until tomorrow to use something, but, oh, I have Angora all over my chin, but to use it today, um, I, I need to live for today just a little bit more. Uh, I think that while I'm still always going to be frugal and, um, and try not to be wasteful, I think the greatest waste um, we really can have is to not do, to not live, to not experience. So 
that is my themes for this year. But there's one more little quick sneak. <laughs> In thinking about all this, I have, um, I pretty much decided that when Tour de Fleece comes around in July again, that I'm going to try to do a daily vlog for Tour de Fleece. So there's my little, um, little tidbit, tantalizing tidbit. While I may not want to do a daily vlog every day of the year, I do think doing a daily vlog in July and a doing a daily vlog in December seems to be quite balanced. And part of the reason that I have come to pretty much making this decision, if everything goes well, <laughs> is because when it is winter in Europe, it is summer in, say, Australia, and vice versa. And December and July, to me, are the winter and summer, at least in my mind, and I realize that while we may not necessarily in um, the Northern Hemisphere think of woolly garments in, um, <laughs> in July, but the people in the Southern Hemisphere, that's their winter and that's when they may be doing more of their spinning. So I thought it seems to be a good thing, this notion of doing a uh, daily vlog in those months. Now, whether or not it's going to be a true daily vlog, <laughs> whether or not I will be doing a vlogmas again, I don't know. But I do know this. I think that July and December make sense for me to have a challenge that incorporates maybe something like my jar of suggestions that is a spin-along concept or a craft-along concept. So there's a sneak peek into my 2023. I am so glad that you have stayed <laughs> to listen to me to this point. Um, I do like to do my vlogs a little bit more to the 20 minute, not the 30 minute um, mark these days. But I wanted to bring all this to you and I wanted to again wish you a wonderful and happy new year of 2023 and I hope to see you again soon after spending more time unwinding with fiber and fabric until then wishing you all the best we'll see you hopefully very soon mm -hmm.